Hi everyone. Um, I wanted to share today a an interesting test case that I ran across in in some work that I'm doing. I'm I'm doing this big refactoring uh, about uh, really simplifying the uh, a part of the solver that deals with type families. And and right now there's this very complicated thing where the type families become these flattened metavars and flattened skolums and all this stuff. Anyway, we figured out we could get rid of the whole thing um, in close collaboration with, with Simon PJ. And um, I'm working on that, but I came across this interesting test case that I wanted to, to share with you today. So it is, let's see, test case, uh, it's GHC, test suite, tests, um, Type check, oh, should compile T. There it is. That's the one. Okay. So so let's let's look at this for a sec. So here we have two type families, F and unF. And the idea is that this harkens back to the day before we had uh, injective type families, also known as the type family dependencies extension. Uh, and in here, uh, the way that we're sort of mocking up injective type families is to say, well, for this type B, uh, unF and F, are, are inverses. So un f of f of b equals b. Um, and, and so we have this, this function f. And then g calls f. Um, so g has some type variable a, and f is also injective on that type variable a. This also is before we had quantified constraints where we could say for all a. So we don't have that in this, in this test case. Um, and now we're passing f an argument of type f a. And, and the key step is going to be is to figure out when we call f, Right, whenever we call a polymorphic function in Haskell, we have to figure out what all the type variables get instantiated to. So f has one type variable, b, so we have to figure out what it's going to be instantiated at when we call it from f. Um, and, and, so, and, that's, and that's sort of the key challenge here. Uh, so I'm going to take this code and uh, oh i'll just edit in this file I'll undo my edits when I'm, when I'm all done so let's get rid of all that stuff because that's that's actually i don't think very helpful here um so so what we end up with is when we're making this call so everything is about this call right here that's what i want to focus on um, not the definition of f itself and so when we make that call so f well this is, f is this polymorphic function and so it's quantified over some type b right i can write here for all b. Um, by the way, I should say this this compiles. Um, oh well, not when I have an unterminated comment, it doesn't. But it it is meant to compile, so this is meant to be a correct program. I think that's that's helpful to understand that. Um, let me make that smaller. Okay. So, um, so we're not worried about the definition of of f here. Uh, again, we're worried about the call of f from g. So when we do that, we say okay. So f is quantified over this type variable b. Um, and so we're going to make a new unification variable, which I'll call beta, and, and say that that we're going to instantiate the type of f. So really now we're thinking about unf, unf of f of beta equals beta f beta to unit. Okay, so that's the instantiated type of f when we call it from g. Um, but we have some information. Here. We know that this is true. So we're going to write that down as a given. So and I'm going to name the given G1. So this given is un f of f of a equals a. And then we have a wanted, which I'll call w1. And we want to know that un f of f beta is beta, right? This is a requirement of calling f. We need to be able to satisfy this constraint. It's, it's sort of like if we have a show a constraint on a function, we need to know that that's true for the particular type that we're calling the function at. Um, we also have one more wanted, and that is that the type of the thing that we're passing in matches the type that we're expecting. So this type here is going to say that f a equals f beta. And the, the question is not only can we satisfy both wanteds, uh, but can we figure out exactly what beta should be? That's really the question here. So, so we look at these. Um, our given here, well, there's not much to do with that. Uh, but one, one key question that we have to think about when solving is that we're going to use these equalities for rewriting. So we have a choice here with this one. Um, there's not much we can we can really do, but do we want to rewrite a every time we see a? Do we want to rewrite that to unf of f of a, 
or every time we see unf of f of a, do we want to rewrite that to a? Um, and, and we can't have both because that wouldn't terminate. Uh, so, so the real question is, which way to use for rewriting? Well, actually, the answer here is is easy. We must use we must keep unf of f of a on the left. Um, and the reason for that is that if we switch it around and we rewrite a to unf of f of a, well, that has infinite regress, right? Because a is mentioned on the other side. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we PL people call this an occurs check error, right? Every time we do a, a rewrite, we like to see, does the variable that we're rewriting, does it occur? So it's, an, it's called an occurs check. Um, so otherwise, we have an occurs check error. And sometimes GHC mentions this in, in type error messages. I think it probably shouldn't, but th that's a problem for another day. Um, OK, so, so that's, that's our given. Good. Now we look at this wanted. Um, and, and this wanted here, uh, it's, much, it's much the same. So we can't really make any progress on this. right? We can't choose. We can't say, oh, we know what beta should be. It should be unf of f of beta, because again, that has this occurs check problem. Um, and so instead, we're going to store this around, use it for rewriting. Uh, but um, and we're going to keep it in the same order uh, because of the same occurs check problem. Uh, and then this w2, what are we going to do with w2? We can't really make progress here either exactly, it doesn't seem. Um, but now we have a real question, what order do we put it in? Right? Do we want to rewrite fa to f beta? or rewrite f beta to f a. Um, so uh, let's just see what happens if we keep it in this same order. So if we keep it in this same order, then what we do is we say, OK, this is now an equality that we can use for rewriting. And whenever we know a new equality, we're going to go through all of the equalities that we already have processed and see, do any of them, have we learned something that's relevant to any of them? Uh, we call this kicking out. Um, because we can imagine, but not, not imagine, this is actually what happens. So the inert set is now these two constraints, and we call this last one the work item, um, because this is sort of the, the new one that we're putting in. And whenever we process a work item, we want to look in the inert set. Should we kick anything out of the inert set because it can be rewritten? So we look, let's say, we, again, we're going to keep the order the same way that it's written here for W2. So we look at this G1. We say, oh, well, G1, that mentions FA. And we know something that we can rewrite FA. But, but G1 is a given, and W2 is a wanted. And so when we're trying to solve for things, we don't want to rewrite givens with wanteds because that can create loops. Right? If we think about theorem proving, right, we don't want to use our wanted to then learn more about our given. Our givens are sort of sacrosanct. We can't, we can't alter them. So we can't modify G1. So we keep G1 in the inert set. And then we look at, at W1 here. And W1, well, we're rewriting FA. F, W1 doesn't mention FA, so we won't kick W1 out either. So if we try keeping FA equals F beta, then we're not going to kick anything out, and we just give up, and we report a type error. So that's really unsatisfying because, well, as we see, GHC doesn't do this, right? We, we, know, we can actually solve this. So, um, so now let's try F beta equals F A. So if we try F beta equals F A, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go through the inert set and see what we can kick out. This first one, this G1, well, again, we're not going to ever kick out a given because we're adding a wanted. Wanted can't rewrite given. So G1 stays right where it is. W1, oh, hmm. Here, our new wanted now, so I'm going to call this W2 prime. So uh, with W2 prime, this mentions F beta. We've now learned that we can rewrite F beta. So this is going to cause us to kick out W1. OK, so now if we look at, so we're going to end up in this new situation where we have an inert set which is the given G1. This is still in from earlier. But now we have a wanted W2 prime, which is F beta equals F A. And then we have a work item, which is wanted W1 unf of F beta equals beta. 
Well, if this is our work item, we're going to rewrite this using the equalities that we know. So we know that f beta equals f a. OK, so we'll rewrite that to f a. Ah, and now we have this fact. We can use this for rewriting. So we rewrite this to a. And now we have a equals beta. That's easy. Just choose beta to be a. And then once we do that, we can now go back. And now we, um, once we do this, this wanted w2, that mentions beta, so it gets kicked out. So now our work item is f beta equals f a. But we're going to end up rewriting this to f a equals f a. And surely we can solve that. And that's it. We've solved our wanted. So our program is accepted. All is well. So we have to go back. So now it all comes back to the order that we chose for this w2. And why choose to put f beta on the left and not f a? Um, so in why choose f beta on the left? Um, because beta is a unification variable. It can be mentioned in wanted. So the idea here is that if we're, if we're adding a wanted to our inert set, we only we want to set it up so that it can rewrite other wanted. It's never going to rewrite a given, right? So putting f a on the left isn't going to help. So we have a little analysis in GHC that says, OK, if one side mentions things that can be in wanted and the other side doesn't, orient it so that the things mentioned in wanted can be on the left. Um, in, in practical terms, I can share a little bit of code with you. This is in, in, my, in my patch that I'm working on. Uh, let's see, where is this? This is in, um, uh, in the compiler, in GHC, in the type checker, in part of the solver, in the canonicalizer. I have a function can eek tie var fun eek. Oh, no, that's not the one. I want can eek lhs2. Um, uh, or maybe it's can e can oh here I am can e can lhs2 the idea is, is that when I have two different uh, sides of an equality both of which sort of fit as a possible left hand side I end up here to try to figure out what the order should be and we're in the tie fam versus tie fam case and so we want to check if any of the variables on the right actually could end up on the left then do a swap. Um, and, uh, and actually, as I'm looking at this right now, I should probably check to make sure that this, this condition isn't also true of, of the left-hand side so we don't swap unnecessarily because swapping just causes a little bit of extra work. Um, but in any case, this is the key check. If I don't do this check, then that program fails. And that, that was the bug that, that sort of initiated the analysis for this check. So I hope you found this interesting. And um, uh, thanks for watching. Bye.